flash talk is about interplanetary internet, which is a very serious topic, and so I'm going to ask you two very difficult questions. The first, let's assume that starting tomorrow, Google and Facebook are going to ask you to give up your full web browsing history. Everything you do and everything you've ever done online is now theirs to use. If you agree, nothing much will change. But if you don't, they threaten to make your internet slow. Every web page you load will now take minutes instead of seconds. So are you willing to trade some of your privacy for fast internet? The second question, do you think that I kind of look a bit like Matt Damon? <laughs> I mean, now that I mention it, right? It's, it's the funniest thing people kept telling me, and I, I wouldn't believe it. But then, I saw The Martian, a movie in which Matt Damon plays an astronaut who's stuck on Mars, and he has to survive using science. Great movie. But there was one thing that I thought was a bit unrealistic, and that is that Matt Damon does not like disco music. I mean, honestly, who doesn't like disco music? But they say it like five times that he doesn't like it, but it's all he has on Mars. And I'm sitting there thinking, well, why don't they just upload in some Taylor Swift or Justin Bieber so we can die faster? <laughs> but they don't, and, and I started looking into it, and it turns out that space communications are really, really slow. And we currently have several spacecraft out there that we're still talking to, and NASA has this nifty website. We can follow all of that live. And a couple of weeks ago, the Kepler spacecraft was talking to us at 160 bits per second. What does that mean? At that speed, Justin Bieber's smash hit, Baby, will take about three hours to download. Three hours for one song. That's insane. So why is it? Why is it so slow? Well, one of the reasons is because we're using microwaves and radio waves. And these are the type of electromagnetic radiation in the spectrum, where we have some ultraviolet on the left, and then we have our visible light, some infrared, and then the micro and radio waves. And we can see that these are actually the biggest, the longest of the waves. They have the least amounts of ups and downs in a given time interval. We say that they have a low frequency. This means that the amount of data that we can encode into them is actually already quite low to start with. The second problem is that these waves lose strength over distance. It's actually very similar to sound. I hope everyone here can just hear me just fine, but if you were to get up and move down that long corridor, it wouldn't take long before you would have trouble understanding what I'm saying, even though I'm using a microphone. So if it's all so bad, then why have we been using it for all this time? Why have we been using it for all this time? Um, no, I skipped something, yeah. So because uh, this loses strength, we need very big and very sensitive equipment to be able to even detect these waves. And even then, there's going to be a lot of loss. So why have we been using it for all this time? <laughs> well, these things look kind of intimidating, but they're actually not that difficult to build. And we've been doing it for decades, so we're actually quite good at it. But the other thing is, because these waves are so long, they're very difficult to stop. They don't care about clouds or atmosphere. That means that we can build these dishes right here on Earth, instead of having to build them up there in space, which would be much, much more expensive. So these waves are slow, yes, but they're kind of easy to use. And for our scientific missions, that's been enough. But we all know that recently, we started thinking bigger. And that's in part due to this guy, Elon Musk and SpaceX. And boys, does this guy have big dreams, huh? He wants to go to Mars. He wants to build a colony of hundreds, thousands of colonists. And just like you and me, when they're done with a hard day of planting potatoes, they're going to want to go home and watch some Netflix. And that's not going to be possible with these radio waves. And for a long time, we were wondering, how can we make this faster? Until in 1977, 
a group of scientists made a documentary, a film about space travel and space communications. And over time, this has become very influential. I think maybe one or two of you here might have seen it. And it's so popular because it was the first to introduce a radical new technology. <laughs> Lasers. And it turns out that these things are not just good for cutting off people's hands, they can also be used for communications. And the concept is quite simple. Where we first we started all the way down on the right, how about we just nudge a little bit to the left? Let's start using infrared light. And we can see that these waves are already much shorter. They have a higher frequency. And so the amount of data they can hold is already much larger than those radio waves. The second thing is that we can focus light into a single concentrated laser beam. And this is also going to lose some strength over distance, but it's going to be much less pronounced. And so we can go further and faster. Now, if this is all so amazing, then why haven't we been using it since the beginning? Well, for one, the hardware is a bit more difficult now. Because we're dealing with light, we now need optics and lenses, not to mention the lasers themselves. And that focus beam is nice, but now we have to be much more accurate in where we aim it, or we might miss our receiver completely. And the other thing is, because these waves are so small, they certainly do care about clouds. You can see that here in this example. This is an experiment where they uploaded this image from Earth to a satellite orbiting the moon using a laser. And all the white pixels you see, all the noise, is loss due to that atmospheric interference. Luckily, as you can see on the right, we also have methods of dealing with that. But these typically include variants of, let's just send every pixel a couple of times and hope one of them gets there. So that lowers the amount of bandwidth that we can use. Still, scientists are optimistic. They think that a single laser can reach speeds of up to a gigabit per second. A gigabit per second. If you recall before, it took three hours to download Justin Bieber's baby. At a gigabit per second, we will be able to download that 44 times in one second. 44 times <laughs> in one second. And although that's already quite impressive, it's not going to be enough to bring Netflix to those thousands of colonists. So we're going to have to scale up even more. We don't need one satellite. We need thousands. We're going to need a couple here on Earth. We're going to need a couple on Mars. And then we're going to need a couple in between to relay the signals. And if you're thinking, that sounds expensive. That's because it is. And that's why big companies like Google and Amazon and SpaceX are working on ways to mass produce these satellites and on cheap ways of getting them into orbit. They're not yet doing this to bring internet to Mars, they're doing this to bring internet to Earth. To make sure that everywhere you can have a good internet connection, even where there are no wires or cellular coverage. But of course, these same systems will be able to be reused um, to create a swarm of satellites, each equipped with a high-powered laser to create our interplanetary internet. And so the previous times I gave this talk, this was it, this was the end, because we've reached our goal. We can now have Netflix on Mars. But last time, apparently, there was a professor of astrophysics in the audience. And when I was wrapping up, he suddenly gets up out of his seat and he yells, I'm shocked. I mean, I ask him, what, what do you mean? Did I, did I forget something? And he says, yes. And the thing you forgot is so important that the physicist who spent his life researching it is one of the most famous people in the world. And he opens his bag and he, he pulls out this picture. 
And I'm standing there. Duh. Stephen Hawking. <laughs> Let me tell you, physicists don't have a sense of humor. <laughs> but he was right. He, the professor was right. Because Albert Einstein's theory of relativity implies that nothing can move faster than the speed of light. Nothing. Not even lasers. And I was thinking, well, that's not a problem, because light is hella fast, right? Light travels at 300,000 kilometers a second. In that single second, it can go around the Earth seven times. So yes, it's fast. The problem is that space is really, really big. The sun is millions of kilometers away. And so it takes its light about eight minutes to get here. Eight minutes. And the distance to Mars, well, it varies. It's about three light minutes when we're nice and close together, but a whopping 22 light minutes when we're on opposite sides of the sun. And unless someone finally proves Einstein wrong, there's nothing we can do about this. This is the fastest that will ever go. And this has serious consequences for our telecommunications. This means that we will never have live two-way communication between the planets. To put it differently, if you're a colonist, you won't be able to have a telephone conversation with your mom here on Earth. Then again, maybe she was the reason you moved to Mars in the first place. <laughs> but don't worry, um, Netflix is safe. We will still have Netflix. <coughs> the only thing is that it's going to take, at worst, 44 minutes from when you press that play button until the movie actually starts rolling. And that's long. That's way too long. We're going to have to solve that. And maybe we can look at that obscure little documentary again for the solution. Maybe we can use clones. We can use copies. Maybe we can put some servers on Mars and copy over websites and movies. So that when you go online there, you're looking at the local Martian copy instead of having to go all the way back to Earth. That's going to be just as fast as we used to. Sounds great, but there's a big problem, and that is the internet is way too large. We can't copy all of it. We don't have enough bandwidth. We don't have enough disk space. So we're going to have to somehow select the content that we're going to clone. And the ideal content is, of course, going to be the things that the colonists are going to want to watch in, let's say, about an hour. So we're going to need to somehow predict what these people are going to be interested in. And the way we typically predict the future is by looking at the past. I'm going to give you an example. Let's say that you, today, have watched My Little Pony. And you've also watched My Little Pony every day for the past week. Then it's highly likely that you are a 30-year-old male academic and that you'll be watching it again tomorrow. And so, so we can start preloading this content. And the way it's going to work in practice is they're going to put together the histories of all these colonists. And they're going to make one list. They're going to say, well, 100% is going to watch Star Wars, episode 25, top of the list. 80% uh, visits Facebook every day on the list. 2% likes My Little Pony. It's probably not going to make the cut. And that is going to make a couple of people very disappointed, I can tell you. So this brings us back to the beginning. I, I ask you a question. Are you willing to trade some of your privacy, your browsing history, in exchange for fast internet? And I hope that made a couple of people a bit uneasy. Because we don't really trust these big companies with our data anymore, do we? Yet on Mars, it might be the only way that we can have fast internet. And even then, maybe not for everyone, or not all the time. And so maybe the real question that I should have asked you is, how comfortable are we with these big companies controlling what we can and cannot see? on Mars, but also here on Earth. 
And it's good. It's, it's something that we have been thinking about. We've had discussions about net neutrality. We're all worried about Russia using Facebook to manipulate the American elections. But to this day, we have not found an answer to this question. We can't solve it. And the point that I'm trying to make is we had better solve it soon because the technology is going so fast, it's leaving us behind. While we are still getting used to having smartphones and constant access and what this is doing to our society, there's this idiot on a stage talking about exporting all of that to another planet. It's all going so fast. And I hope that after this talk you agree that going to Mars is no longer science fiction. We've seen the rockets. We've talked about the lasers and the swarms of satellites. And we can even deal with some of Einstein's shenanigans. So I'm very sure that we will see the first person on Mars. I'm quite sure that we will see the first permanent colony. And I am naively hopeful that maybe one day I might be able to go up there myself in order to perfect my Mark Watney cosplay. <laughs> so it's happening. Even though we don't know yet what the effect it's going to have on us as a society. And I, for one, I'm not just happy to just sit by and wait. I want to be a part of it. I want to help solve not only the technical, but also the ethical problems. And so I see this talk as my job application for SpaceX. So to finish, I just would like to ask a question of Mr. Elon Musk. So, Mr. Musk, if you're watching this on YouTube, hi. <laughs> I hope you liked it. And I just have one question. Elon, do you think that maybe you and I, we kind of look a bit like Matt Damon? <laughs> Thank you. Baby.